Hey guys, it's your host Julian. This week I'm sitting down with Kevin Alatieri to talk all things Batman the Animated Series. If you guys are in the Kansas City area, swing over to Planet Comic Con Kansas City March 8th through the 10th to get some artwork and ask a question or two. I want to give a special shout out to a couple of our patrons that help make this podcast each week possible. Bill, Brent, Brittany, Eight-Legged Bird, Patrick, and Jacob. Thank you all so much for your support. It truly means a lot. If you want to become a patron and help support this show, check the show notes and sign up today. One quick side note if you guys submitted a question for Kevin. We ran out of time during this episode. However, the episode we released last week with Dan and Kevin have the questions that you guys asked. So make sure you go and check that one out. Now, let's get to my chat with Kevin. How does how Kevin do get on uh, Batman the Animated Series? How do I how do I get on it? Um, yeah. Well, I worked with uh, Bruce at Deke. Like I was, um, Deke was like my entree into the animation industry. It was like the first animation jobs I had. Before that, I was doing like uh, B movie uh, special effects. Well, actually, not all B movies. Like I worked on things like Megaforce and for Intervision, and I did a lot of TV commercials. I was you know, doing a lot of storyboards, and I had done comics for uh, Cartoons Magazine. Mm-hmm. So before that, but I was working at Deke in the early 80s, and about the time I was working on Cops, I met Bruce, so we knew each other. And uh, Bruce, uh, he was on... He was on Cops briefly, and then he was on uh, Beanie and Cecil. But, you know, we were in the same studio, so we knew each other. And when they started Batman, um, I think Bruce was told by someone, that, oh, you got to get Kevin on this, because it's like, you know, he's one of the very few guys that can do action, you know. I'd done Alf Tales and, you know, I was in Starcom and, like, in Cops, and I was None of them really satisfied me, you know, as far as being action cartoons. So actually, Bruce contacted me and said, you know, we're doing a new Batman, you know, a new Batman cartoon. And I'd heard about it. And I was like, oh, great. The Tiny Toons guys are doing a new Batman. This is going to be a new Super Friends. <laughs> you know? So I'm like, I'm, I'm kind of snobby. I, I had, I, where was I working at that time? I was, at that time, I think I was in development on Lion King and uh, Treasure Plant. And I I had left Disney, so it was like the right timing. And I ended up going to the office, and I was like as smug as can be. And Bruce showed me this trailer that they did. And I was like, holy shit, they're doing, they're doing Fleischer Superman. Oh, my God, I can't believe it. It's like, it's like... They want to do flight, you know, and, and they openly said, you know, Gene McCurdy and Bruce and Eric, you know, they all said, yeah, yeah, we're, we're doing, uh, we're, we're trying to emulate, you know, the Fleischer Supermans. And so from that instant, I was on board. They hired me as a director. There wasn't anyone there yet. I think it was just me for a few weeks there. It was just me and Bruce and Eric and Ann Lighting and, you know, it's just like the skeleton crew, just, you know, before they were actually hiring and bringing on more people. So I was, I was, I was on it right from the beginning of the series. You know, so it, what it, were, it was, that, ahead, it was that trailer that sold me, boy. I mean, as soon as I saw that thing, you know, everyone's seen it now, but man. Was what was like, the, what was the trailer for the folks that might not have seen it? Was it just that, uh, that, that, that intro? It, the opening is kind of, the opening of the series, the first opening, you know, that with uh, without the titles and stuff, that's kind of what the original trailer was. It was just like, it, you know, it was kind of like four minutes of Batman doing his thing, catching these robbers, you know, getting into a fight the way that Batman fights. Big close up with the eyes, like, you yeah. know, squinting down and everything. It was just, it was all the tropes that became Batman were kind of in that that original trailer that they did i think that was animated in um, canada 
but it, it just had this really unique look that you never saw other than outside of uh, Fleischer Supermans and stuff. So with that initial, with that initial trailer catching, with that initial trailer catching you, um, what was, you were there since the early days, but what was those, what was that main focus from, from Bruce and Paul? Was there anything that they were really trying to push and get in there for Batman? Cause this is a couple years after the 89 Batman, the Keaton Batman was coming out. So I got to imagine Batman fever was oh, yeah. just, you know, going everywhere. But, uh, what was, what was that? What was that? Um, what was it called? What was that feeling like, or that emotion like with Batman just being on everybody's mind? Um, well, I'm kind of, I'm a nerd and mm -hmm. I'm a geek, you know, and it's like, and everything's kind of, I really wasn't aware of it or I was, I was probably the only one mm -hmm. that wasn't really concentrating on that. Um, I mean, I liked the Tim Burton movie. I, I like, I think Tim Burton's really good, but um, I wasn't really impressed because Michael Keaton, great actor, just, you know, I just, I, I'm such a snob. Like I go there and it's like, how come the smallest guy is Batman? Yeah. The big guy should be Batman, you know? Yeah. You know, and Jack Nicholson's just Jack Nicholson. He's not, you know, it's like, I, I, I mean, he's the Joker. Yeah. It's like, he's a good actor. It's great. But I just can't help but there's Jack Nicholson with mm -hmm. a smile, you know. So I wasn't really, you know, the, the, the fever was there in the attention. Um, I really didn't, I, I was really, I was just kind of nose to the grindstone because at that time, the crew that we had, and it's true of the whole industry, action adventure had not really been done. So finding artists that could do that was really difficult. So it was like really, especially on Leather Wings, which was the pilot, we're, I'm spending so much time correcting stuff and trying to get that Bruce Tim style in the characters. Mm -hmm. We actually had layout people who were animators that would like refuse to draw like Bruce. You know, I was like, well, you better draw like Bruce. What are they gonna do, fire me? Just might, yeah. just might happen if you can't get the style. I mean, we need that style, you know. And people could go off of it a little bit. And like some of the best layout guys were just, you know, they, you know, they were really good. So I was just spending so much time doing the cartoon, mm -hmm. and there was so much drawing and stuff, and and we were doing full layouts in the in studio, um, that I really didn't know anything until. I went to a WonderCon, which was, used to be a great con up in uh, Oakland, California. And I used to fly up there and just go there. And I went there and uh, I knew uh, because I had friends that were working at DC Comics and stuff. You know, I ran and I went over to the DC booth and there was Denny O'Neill. And Denny O'Neill mm. was kind of like heading up. So he says, hey, I, so I said, he said, Kevin, we love your cartoon at the office, man. It's like, as a matter of fact, we're going to be showing it today. And I'm like, oh, really? Yeah. He said, yeah, you got to stop by. You got to stop in. It's going to be on at like 2.30 or something. Okay. So I go across the street and I have, I have like fish and chips. And of course I have two or three pints, uh -huh. you know, <laughs> of like good old stout in me. And I say, hey, you're going to show my cartoon. I say to my friends, you know, and let's go over there so i go i run across the street and i can hear the theme playing mm -hmm. i walk into this theater and it's packed with people so i just sat in the audience you know and the reaction of the audience like they were there for every freaking moment when uh bat you know when man bat goes screaming past the zeppelin the zeppelin the blimp goes screaming past and the, the pilot goes huh and he's following that and all of a sudden batman's face hits the screen the whole audience jumped you know and i yeah. was like that's what i want and when the final fight's happening and batman's on man bat's back and just like letting them have it this kid in front of me goes they finally fucking did it <laughs> they, they did they they did they did it and so, of course, you know, the audience erupts and I'm like, wow, this is 
I had no idea. Oh, okay. This is this is good. This is before the thing's even on the air, you know. <laughs> now you talk to Dan Reba and Bruce and everyone else, and they're sitting there saying, Oh, we knew this was gonna be big. I had no idea. I mean, I was just I was just working, I was just trying to get it right. And uh, of course, Denny O'Neill says, Hey, I think the director's in the audience here. Hey, Kevin, come on up. I'm like, oh man. I really wish I didn't have that last beer, <laughs> you know, because I'm not, and I'm up there and it's like, it's embarrassing. You know, I was embarrassed. They say, so who's that voice? Who's that guy playing Batman? And I go, it's Kevin. And I realized at that point, I only knew Kevin as Kevin because mm -hmm. we both had the same name. We'd walk in and say, hey, Kevin, hey, Kevin, you know, that's how I knew Kevin Conroy. <laughs> I didn't, I just blanked on his last name. I couldn't, I was not prepared or anything, but yeah, that, <laughs> that that's the first time I actually had an idea that this was going to go over really, really big. What a way to go over really big. You know what I mean? Um, now I, I asked this question typically of, of everybody, what was it like, you know, seeing your name in the first, uh, the first time you saw your name in the credits, um, and then what was it like, you know, sitting out there watching it, you know, with the crowd that was not the people at the studios, not the, the voice cast or not the, you know, not anybody that worked on the show, seeing it with a real civilian audience, getting real honest answers or real honest emotions whenever something would happen on the screen, um, Obviously, you said you had a few too many uh, of those those stouts. You said um, so it might be a little hazy. But do you remember like that that what what did that feeling feel like to you? I got I got to imagine it was wild. It might have been surreal. Yeah, uh, surreal. Yeah, because yeah. up until then, my my entire career in animation was like, uh, well, the the studios like I knew that Alf and Alf Tales were hits for nbc mm -hmm. you know the, the executives would let you know and i knew that cops was doing well and i knew you know you know you know your cartoons are doing well and mm -hmm. they're critically you know but as a director you know i'm staying up till four in the morning constantly you know it's like the the amount of storyboards we're doing is just astonishing how many like especially on ghostbusters mm -hmm. it's like how much I had to do with Ghostbusters. It's shocking. And you get no credit at all. Your name's just one of the ones that's at the end that they're just yeah. flicking through those credits as fast as they can. And I even designed the end credits and I don't get a credit, <laughs> you know? Wow. And uh, yeah, it's like, and Warner Brothers just had the policy. It's like, no, director gets a title card. You know, it's just it was just their policy at the time, which I think Steven Spielberg insisted on that for Tiny Toons. So it just became company policy. You know that that a director actually got credit. Um, at that time, like Disney was doing some really good cartoons, but if you look at the Disney credits, there they said directed by so and so. The t the TV shows, those are timing directors. Mm -hmm. Those guys couldn't draw for shit. <laughs> to be blunt, hope you don't mind. <laughs> Not at all, man. I, I I like honesty on this one. Now, yeah, like, and there's tremendous artists through all over the place, and they're and they're just names. They're just boom buried in the back credits. You know, you know, voice, voice, voice. Yeah, these artists. When I was a little kid, like and um and. Part of the, another part of the reason why I'm in love with animation so much is like Johnny Quest. Mm -hmm. um, Johnny Quest, if you look at like the old the old school ones, they didn't give so many uh, technical um, credits, mm -hmm. you know. And the credits that were given were there was they went by pretty fast, but there they gave credit where credit was due. You know, the artists really got credit, like. I knew Alex Toth worked on that episode because I could read it in the credits, you know, and, and my young eyes and my young brain, I could, you know, I actually would do something like I would, I would like blink my eyes. So you'd get like a shutter a shutter snapshot, yeah. snapshot of, you know, and, and I would be able to read the credits that way. 
So, you know, trying to catch these things. So that's why I knew who Doug Wildey was and why I knew who Alex Toth was and Mike Sikowski and, you know, you, you name them. Iwo Takamoto, you know. The, the, Such and legends. Then, yeah, yeah. It's like all, all the Hanna-Barbera cartoons were, you know, not all of them, but things like Space Ghost, you know, Dino Boy and, and things like that. I don't know if you Very can see him, but... Uh... Got yes, the space ghost right there. You know, I can't point. Fuck, uh, made me look <laughs> dumb. But yeah, I've got a, a couple of those. Alex Toth is one of those guys that I am just so fascinated with. I mean, his artwork. You know, the fact that he designed so many characters that will go down as as could literally be on anybody's Mount Rushmore. You could pick ten of them, and they'd be all on somebody's Mount Rushmore. Um, just a phenomenal talent, man. Um, yeah. With uh, with 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 you getting on. I'm sorry. What'd you say? Huge influence, not just with me, but everybody on Batman. Oh, I could, you could tell. I mean, it was the, that, that one. What was another influence on that one? Cause for sure you said Fleischer and, and then Toth, and you could definitely see those two in there. But is there any one that Bruce and Paul really wanted to push for? Um, I don't know. Like Paul at the beginning, Paul wasn't, Paul was still on Tiny Toons. I mm -hmm. think it's like Mr. Freeze, I think was the only, was his, only script at the time i'm not part sure. of ice yeah part of ice yeah but uh yeah but the, um as far as like influence well believe it or not i tell people this but character design wise uh I, how would i describe the style of batman well it's a cross between uh alex toth and dan de carlo mm -hmm. archie yeah, yeah. wow because there's like there was a wonderful simplicity about the Archie comics, um, especially when you got guys like Dan DiCarlo and stuff. It's like just how they would, just the line they would use, and you know, mm -hmm. just very elegant how they got to, um, you know, it's like with just like the very how just how uh, Dan DiCarlo would draw such a pretty girl with so few lines. Yes. You know? That was stuff that we were trying to dissect and trying to absorb, you know. So, the, yeah, those are the influences. And, and you know, and, and background-wise, you know, it's like that was uh, Ted Blackman. So mm -hmm. that was all the, you know, it was like Hugh Ferris. We, we all had these Hugh Ferris books and stuff, you know, like 1930s, 1940s architecture, you know, architects. And... uh Disney, the high style Disney that was done like in the 50s, like Ivan Earl, mm -hmm. that those, th you know, those were all influences. But, you know, but everyone there was like enthusiastic and like kind of grew up on all this stuff. So it was like, finally, we get a chance to let loose and do it. And we actually had animation studios that could accomplish it, which is always a big problem at Deek. Although, the deep connection is still there. We're like when I came over, Ken Dur came over. He was we all knew each other from Deke. Me, Dan Reba, Brad Raider, you know, uh, Mike Gogan, Mark Wallace. The, we were all at Deke together, and mm -hmm. we were all like huge Japanese animation fans too. So the Japanese studio Spectrum uh, Fukuda was actually someone that we worked with, and we had been over in Japan with him i i was at deke they were sending me over to japan all the time with every one of these shows so you got to know all the animation the japanese animation uh, directors and they just uh well that's why tms ended up on the show you know yeah. it was like those kind of connections and ken dur he you know became a producer but he was over at deke he started out as just a translator because perfect you know perfect english to japanese translation i got really spoiled with that guy because i could just talk straight to a director and it's it's like instant you know i just had this guy translating in you know and you know he's translating it the way you're speaking it's not some stilted weird weird kind of thing and yeah. he came up with batman and the, he had all the connections for the animation studios so that's part of the reason why we got such high quality on some, not on all of them, but Spectrum, TMS, you know, did excellent, excellent work. 
If you're into anime, manga, comic books, movie reviews, or just pop culture, Spoiler Force Podcast is the place for you. Not only do I talk about nerdy topics, I have conversations with a variety of guests, such as musicians, Comic-Con artists, cosplayers, other podcasters, and people from all over the world. Join me as I go on this journey to find ways to help others express themselves with their creativity. So when I think of Batman, when I go and buy my comics every Wednesday, because I'm still a Wednesday warrior, the voice I hear in Batman is still Kevin Conroy whenever Batman is oh, talking. Not, yeah, there's, there's the, it, it's everyone else just kind of who plays Batman. There's been some good actors who go for mm. it. No Nobody's one, Batman like Kevin Ryan. No one gets it. No one gets it. And Kevin Conroy, when I when I first met him, I'm six feet tall. Mm-hmm. Looking up. Here's yeah. this happened broad shouldered, good lantern jawed, good looking guy. You know, and he and it, and his regular voice is yeah, just it's kind of light, you know, it's normal. It's mm-hmm. kind of light normal but then then when he plays batman it's like he transforms deep and it's not like a put on gravelly weird thing like i i want to see you bleed oh fuck Mm. you oh sorry i shouldn't be but it's just like god what why why would you you wouldn't talk like that you know Mm. kevin conroy the guy just nails it just nails it and uh and and he act you know and that and he he could have played Batman. He should have played Batman in the live action. He was our role. Batman, though. You know, I, I know he didn't get to do that live action, but there are no. so many people that when we think of Batman, we think of Kevin Conroy. They are 1A and 1B, whatever you want to call it. They are, you can't have one without the other. I close my eyes or whenever I'm reading, like I said, whenever I'm reading Batman every other Wednesday or every, you know, every third Wednesday, whenever it comes out from my comic book store, um, you know, I'm sitting there and I'm hearing Kevin Conroy. I, you know, he is no longer here, sadly. Um, but that, that voice, that performance, that, he put everything into that and we felt that as kids we feel that as teenagers and going back and watching this as an adult man you feel it as an adult yeah you know? no especially like in, especially in that mask of the phantasm mm-hmm. where he really where he really gets in the weird the thing that i i loved is um when you're at the recordings and that was like wonderful you know andrea romano you know the directors have to be at the recording and it's like she was one of the best voice directors ever just for the fact that she could get the talent could attract them to the job you know because they all trusted her and all knew she was good and she would have them all in the room together so the actors are acting on each other and 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 watching Kevin Conroy, one of the early dis- things that he said is he goes, he'd ask a question, you know, it's like, so this is Bruce, but he's alone. And I, and I would say, so this is Bruce, right? Not Batman, but this is Bruce. I said, yes, but he's alone with um, Alfred or he's alone with Dick. And that's okay. Batman's voice is Bruce Wayne's real voice. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was like, that's that's great because that was, you know, Kevin Conroy is an actor. This is what he brings to it. He figured out that, no, that deep Batman voice, like in uh, the episode Avatar, when he's dealing with Talia and he's Bruce Wayne, he's dressed up with job furs and, you know, in just a, a regular suit. He's Bruce Wayne. But when he's with Talia, He's always talking with Batman's voice. That's his, that's mm-hmm. Bruce Wayne's actual persona, and uh, I thought that was like really brilliant. You know, it's like well, it's, you know, it's like whether well, actor would do that. It's like you know, no, the lighthearted, uh, the light voice is a put on. That's it, smart. It, yeah, and, and it's and it's like an anti, and that, that's another thing I loved about the series is that he's the playboy. Mm-hmm. Two Face, Two Face Part One, uh, you know, not in the script, great script, but one of the few things that I stuck in there is like when Harvey's leaving to meet his destiny, to meet his fate with Rupert Thorne, he walks past Bruce, and Bruce is like chatting it up with this really pretty girl, 
you know and she's like <laughs> oh wait i'll be back it's like, but, oh you know it's like even even you know he's he's always playing the playboy we know he's not a playboy we know that when it gets dark he's batman mm-hmm. you know but he he very successfully puts on the playboy act that he does and that's a put on now when with you being there i want to stick on kevin for for just a second because you know, I, I've only had, you're the second guy I've had on from uh, Batman. Um, the first one was Alan Burnett, and that was, uh, you know, almost probably oh, my yeah. first year. So it's almost three years ago. And then I've got Dan Reba coming on um, in a couple of weeks, and I'm really looking forward to it. Um, but uh, so I haven't gotten to do too much Kevin Conroy talk. Now, since you were there since the inception, essentially the beginning of Batman, before anything was ever really released other than that, that little four minute trailer. Um, what I got to imagine Kevin was already cast at that point, but uh, was there anybody that got any real consideration or did they, did Kevin just blow everybody out of the water right out of the gate? Um, from everything I can understand, I mean, I never, I never heard anyone else. <laughs> yeah. You know, I heard a bunch of jokers, you know, mm-hmm. although Tim Curry was the original <laughs> joke. Yeah. Um, but it, for whatever reasons he couldn't, uh, he couldn't do the show. So, you know, I would hear, I heard like 20, 20, 30, 40 different people trying to be the Joker. And they're all mm. pretty good voice actors. Um, and then there's this, then, then you know, you hear this one, and I go, well, that's it. That's it. You the know? great and one. Yeah. Like, that's it. That's it. Oh, this is the perfect one. And then Bruce goes, guess who this is? Mark Hamill. No <laughs> way. It's not Luke Skywalker. <laughs> and it's like, yep. Things like that. But, you know, Kevin Conroy, I don't, I don't think anyone else tried out. I really don't. I yeah. think he was just Andrea knew him and picked him and you the know, rest is just, history. Yeah, I think he just did came showed up for whatever, you know, audition and he got the job. I don't think there was ever a thought of anyone else. That's a good thing. He's such he's such a good actor too. It's like he's he he well, he was a John Houseman uh, theater guy, mm-hmm. you know, and he did Shakespeare and just all sorts of stuff. So he really brought that to it. Like his voice, you can visualize stuff. One of the greatest moments in my entire career was for Harlequinade, when the scene is where Batman has got Harley in the Batmobile. And watching Arlene Sorkin and Kevin Conroy acting that together was just fan- just hilarious. It was fantastic, you know, and just them doing the give and take back and forth. It, actually, there was more give and take and back and forth between Harley and Batman than there ever was with Batman and the Joker. Yeah. You know, the Joker and Batman would yell at each other and say things. But it wasn't like Harley, you know. No, he, you know, he 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 actually took an interest in her. You know, you know the character the, the characters took an interest in you know in it in her because she somehow she might be redeemed. Mm-hmm. So he's always Batman's always interested in that. But just like the 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 relationship that they had in the in the booth was just it was just funny. I'm sorry that you guys couldn't have seen that. But I yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> I, I and and we get to relive it through your eyes and your memories. Now, yeah. with that one, you know, being you like you said, one of your your greatest memories or times with with Kevin and the voice crew and just your your career. Um, was there one or two moments that stuck out that you just you think about, like you think about that story you just told with him and Arlene about Kevin? No, when he when he's doing the. Uh... I was th- I was I on Mask of the Phantasm. I uh, I got you know I I got all the Joker scenes because I had been robbed of the Joker mm-hmm. that first season you know so when it came to Mask of the Phantasm I just went to Bruce and Eric and I and Alan Burnett and just went let me Joker. get it. Joker <laughs> the only Joker I did was the last laugh and that was with Tim Curry which was a thrill, you know, 
so I I ended up at the recording for um, Mask of the Phantasm, and Kevin Conroy doing that. Um, what would I call it? If with Shakespeare be a soliloquy, but where he's talking to his parents mm -hmm. and explaining to them that you know he never thought he was going to be happy. And now he has a chance to be happy. And he says, is that wrong? You know, and all he is, is he's talking to a tombstone. Yes. But there is, man, it's like Kevin Conroy, he went deep, like mm -hmm. deep. Personally, you could see it. Andrea goes walking into the booth after he's done and is like, are you okay? <laughs> you know? Because it's like, I mean, it's like, like it, good actors, it's like, that's what they do. And I, I'm i not sure. It's like, there's so many interviews with him where I'm sure you could find it. But, you know, but he just went someplace that really hurt him in his mm -hmm. life. You know, he just, he went somewhere deep. And that was like, fuck, this guy's, this guy's an actor. It's like, oh my God. <laughs>